So you've removed all your deck boards and you've discovered yourself as a DIY framing nightmare. And I'm going to show you in this video how to fix your structure so that you can repair this and not have to start all over again. So we're going to talk real quick about structural framing for decks outside. And there are two kinds of decks that you can build. One is where it actually has structure and footings and is attached to the house, which by you're actually attaching to the building and all of your posts that are going to the ground are down into a footing that goes below a frost line if you have one in your area, or it's in something solid that's not gonna be in direct contact with dirt so it doesn't cause rotting and premature dropping of your deck. In this situation, this DIY homeowner that built this deck did a combination of both. And you'll see this all the time. People think it's a really good idea to attach to the house and then they just drop some 4x4 posts into the soil. They'll pack it down a little bit maybe. It's all a disaster so we've got all kinds of movement going on. The middle is almost completely sunken right out, out, to, out of sight. And I'll just drop this in here for you to have a quick peek. There is a one inch gap over four and a half feet here. And this is already the low part of the deck. When I go and put my level this way, I am looking at, oh, I can stick my full whole hand underneath here. This is a five foot, sorry, six foot level. It's an eight foot deck. And you get an idea of how dramatic the drop is in the middle here. We can also see that over in that corner over there, they didn't know how to make it level all the way to the outside. So it's attached to the house and the last foot and a half is attached to the post and the post is buried. You can see that going down on the course of brick, over here is the words most visible and dramatic. Now, it's okay to build on top of your concrete step. You can use this as structure. That's not a problem. It's not okay to attach a rim joist to it and then use that as your hanging lumber for the next piece of joist. This is still only attached to two screws on a two by four in that corner and a couple of screws to a sinking four by four post over here. So as that post drops, the entire deck is dropping with it and it's created a real mess and you can see as it all drops of course the butt end up here starts to stick up now the screws are coming loose everything's starting to rot absolute mess of course nothing is ever square but what we can do in this situation is we can come up with a strategy for restoring this frame so that we can actually put a deck surface back on top now the one thing the homeowner that built this did right is he's got his joist on a 16 inch center. So we can start with that. We're not too concerned about it being out of square because the original deck, although it wasn't square with the house, visibly it wasn't, didn't appear to be unsquare. So if you wanna save your deck structure, really what you wanna do is find out where all the load is. And this is what I mean. Since all of the points in this deck meet up in the middle onto this post, this is carrying the majority of the weight. Even when you're walking over here, all the weight is transferred on these beams all over the deck to this one point. So every step that's taken is pushing this into the dirt. So what we wanna do right away is eliminate it. If, because it's less than eight feet here, and this is attached to the house, if we can get this front ridge stable and sitting on floating blocks so it won't sink anymore, then I can put in new lumber and span the whole distance okay, using proper joist hangers, I'm going to be able to get another 20 or 30 years out of this before it starts to sink anymore. And even if it does sink, it's a really simple fix to lift up the deck and put some shim underneath to level it off again. I know it's not perfect, but let's be realistic here. In the real world, when you get a lemon, you got to find a way to make lemonade. So this is what we're going to do today. The only other thing we're going to change other than that is we're going to raise that back corner. And I'm going to show you tips and tricks that you can just cut and raise and reinstall and you're not gonna have to tear all this apart and throw it in the landfill. For me, I would rather have a deck that is 90% structurally solid than start all over again with a brand new investment. All that time, all that waste, all that tree in the garbage, just doesn't make any sense. Bottom line is, decks go in the garbage sooner or later. What you wanna do is find a way to build it so it's strong, safe, and enjoyable for a reasonable amount of time based on your investment. Here, we're gonna resurface, put in some nice railings, we just need to shore this up so we're going to get another 20 or 30 years out of it before it's completely done its use. And I think we can accomplish that. Stay tuned. I'm going to show you all my tips and tricks.
So before I get into cutting this down and repairing it, I just wanted to talk real quick about basic structure technology and options that are available on the market to help extend the life of your deck. One of them is a building tape. This is basically like a, like a really thick tar paper. It's self-adhesive. And the idea is, as you put it on top of your joist and it wraps the sides, and you can see, when we take this deck off, you can see the effect. These are the gaps that are in between the boards, okay? Now, generally speaking, that's not water damage. But, over here you can see, this is where the boards were joined, okay? And that is complete garbage. Now, if you're building your deck, and you're doing fishbone or picture frame, and you're boxing and adding extra wood, and you're gonna have cut ends like that, this was a cedar deck, and even cedar is going to rot out on you, and having all that exposed wet organic material stuck there all the time, that's your enemy. So if you're not going to be the kind of person that takes time to pressure wash all of the joints clean all the time, then use some of this kind of deck protection and it'll help stretch out the length of your deck. The other thing we're going to use here is headlock screws. I love this technology, these things are awesome because they replace the strength of a 3H galvanized lag bolt and they allow me to put structural strength in every piece of lumber that I'm tying together, not relying on nails or screws, so that I've got enough shear strength where I'm being creative with my repairs and I can carry all the weight of a whole family being out here without any risk to their safety. So fasten your seatbelts, here we go. There we go. Let's see. That's already a really big improvement. Just getting rid of that one stupid shim. I think when I look at this, the concept of having the two by four sleepers on top of the concrete pad is sound. I don't like the fact that the con these two by fours come out here and stop and they're not attached to this ridge plate, except for probably some nails. It looks like they use nails on everything, except now I'm seeing screws here. You just, I just, I can't be sure of anything. Wow. The plan is that this two by six needs to be enforced properly at each end so that the wood that it's attached to is actually carrying the weight that this two by six is transferring. Right now, there's two deck screws over here, and there's a couple of nails into the 4x4 four four post over here, I can see, which is interesting. Screws only carry 80 pounds each. It's a lousy shear strength material for the framework of a deck because ACQ screws will rust over time, especially near the front entrance area because people use salt when they've got the ice in the wintertime. And that salt corrodes, which is why we had trouble with a lot of the screws over here ripping out the deck boards. So we're going to put in a proper joist hanger over here, going to get some proper structural screws there as well. And then I think what I want to do is I want to cut this back so I can keep this 2x6 and I can tie in with a new joist from here off this post all the way to the house and we'll get rid of all this mess in the middle. And then I can use a joist hanger and tie this 2x6 and at least that is going to straighten out my deck and get rid of this bow. And once I've got this straight, and I'll do the same thing. I'm going to remove this whole 2x6 joist assembly here. I don't have a choice. I mean, probably the only other thing that I can do is I can cut this one back, remove this hanger, and then put another joist here, and then lift this all into place. That's probably the best that we're going to be able to come up with. And that'll transfer all of my load and get rid of this center post altogether. So that the only place where I'm going to have any repair issues is going to be on the perimeter. Because I don't want to have to ever crawl underneath the deck. I won't have access ever in the future. But if we use the right kind of skirting, we can always have access to do repairs on the post on the outside. So we'll make a couple of cuts, put a couple of new boards in, straighten it all out. And then we're going to show you how to fix the other outside frame. So the irony is, is in the idea of the way this was built, the longest lumber used here was eight feet long. And you can see the, the rim on the other side, the last joist there, is a full piece of wood. And that's the only full piece of wood in this whole build except for the 2x4 at the other end. Everything else in the middle was cut up. I'm not sure why that was necessary. I think originally he, they probably should have stopped right here with the post. Brought a full joist across and tied it together at that point. And all of these could have been full joists had they just got the delivery of the longer wood. All of this would have been avoided. So. I'll just get right into this. This joist is 16 inch on center. It's already in the perfect spot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this as my guide to line up with this. 
and I'm going to cut this piece back right on that edge, right? So if that's my joint, wow, that is really way out, eh? You gotta love it. Basically, all I'm going to do, and I'm just going to mark it with a screw here real quick. So now I have my place where I'm going to cut, and once I've cut this out, I'm also going to remove this and this and the post, and then I'll put in a brand new 2x6 with the joist hanger and transfer this load. Now we're not transferring a lot of load over a lot of space. I know traditionally we like to double these up, but let's be honest, this deck's been here for 20 years, and in this condition it's still kept people safe and out of the dirt. So if we rebuild it in similar fashion with better technology, we're going to get another 20 years out of it. all the weight of sinking this down into the ground. This was actually under pressure being bent over and then it's popped up now that the pressure's gone. That is awesome. Okay, and in the same fashion, this 16 inch line here, we're gonna wanna keep that as well. This piece of two by six, so we don't have to replace the entire carriage area. We're gonna cut this one as well, since this is gonna be removed anyway. That is not a structural nail. Why am I not surprised? All, all the weight of that deck, this whole assembly is on one roofing nail. Just total incompetence. Unbelievable. You know, there's a time and a place to save money when you're building something. But when you're relying on these fasteners to do all of the structural carrying, you really can't afford to go and Whoops, not buy the right nails. You're at the store buying a hanger, pick up the structural screws. They might come in a box that looks something like this. They have the bit in the box. It's really not that difficult. 10 bucks can save somebody from a major injury. You'll notice that when I'm cutting with this saw, I'm actually rocking it back and forth. It's a reciprocator, it means the blade's firing in and out of the housing. But at the end of the day, there's so much bouncing going on that the more the saw's moving itself, the faster the cut. Yep, that shouldn't be able to be done like that. Now what do we got over here? Hey, hey, finishing nails, love it. Nails on one end, screws on the other. Some of them are galvanized, some of them aren't. Somebody who's building this out of a jar of fasteners. Whatever they picked up they used is unbelievable. So there are, there are a lot of connections made here. There are eight joist hangers intermittently thrown around. <laughs> and then at the other end of the joist hanger, there's a piece of lumber that's stuck together with you know, skirt board screws or, oh, God only knows finishing nails. Why even bother putting the hardware on? So these boards are actually in the way. They're not necessary. This and this, this is where the uh, bulk of the joints of the original decking boards were going. Yeah, when it comes apart that easy. <laughs> it fell off the other side. <laughs> Let me guess, we got some more of those really awesome screws. <laughs> Here's a tip for you. If you got a nail that's all soft and weak and you can't hammer it through, put it in sideways. Now roll it over this way. Okay. There, you can pull it out the other side. So now you get an idea of what I'm talking about. We got this all cleaned up. Okay. Put my whole hand underneath here. But when we put our new piece of wood that spans the entire gap and I lift this into the floor joist, bam, my whole deck will be flush. It's still not level, but at this point, all of the load goes from the wall to the outside rim. And then it's just a matter of fixing those few spots. We're going to be good to go. Just going to throw in a little second pair of hands there. That's what I like to call it. We'll swing this one around and we'll set it up. And that's how I'm going to measure. 
So I know I'm perfectly level and I know this isn't square. So I'm going to take both measurements. I'm going to take my monster triangle. Oh, well, that's not too bad. There we go. So when you're building a deck, you don't always have the luxury of the right tool for the right job. And as a homeowner, if you have a skill saw, you've got all you need in order to do your framing, plus one of these. So what I do is I can actually use this as my guard. All right, so I'm going to set the depth of my blade. And this creates that gap from my plate, OK, so that I can run above this. Yep, I'm good. So what I do is I hold this against my wood. I hold the saw plate against the triangle. And I can actually run over until my blade is exactly where I want it. Back it up, start it. And I run the saw against my triangle that I have pinched in place with my hand. That is a technique for cutting all your dimensional lumber. You don't have to use the chop saw. So you can actually have the saw with you, with your triangle, and you can be running around your deck making all your cuts and cutting them on the site. Boom, 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 flip them over and screw them in. It'll save you a lot of running back and forth to a stationary saw like this. Now I put my screw up the corner. There's my second pair of hands again. And I can just slide this along and set that on the rail back there and slide it in place. Okay. We're just going to set this flush with the front rail, drive a screw. So two by six requires a one screw for every two inches. That's your basic concept there. Each screw has got 80 pounds of structural strength attached to it for shear strength. So that's 240 screw pounds at each end when you're using deck screws. Now over here, we're going to end up using our joist hangers, which are crazy strong. We're talking a couple thousand pounds of shear strength. We're going to do the same thing here. Classic example of a homeowner who built a deck who didn't know what he was doing, but he was close. You know, there's a lot of what's done here that was kind of close to right. And with a few modifications, it can all be saved. Remember, every time you're disappointed with something, if you just throw it all in the garbage and start over, that's a lot of garbage. And in today's world, throwing things in the garbage for posterity's sake is just, I think it's irresponsible. So if you don't like what you got, fix it. Don't just toss it out. Now that is almost perfect, except this corner's a little low and our whole front's a little low. So now we've got our structure flat, we'll call it. And we have one, two, three, four, five points where all the wood is sitting in dirt. And that's what we're gonna fix next. Cause really we don't want them sitting in dirt. So all we have to do is cut them off at the bottom and then we will jack the whole deck up Put down a little bit of stone dust and a concrete block that we can set that onto, and we're going to be absolutely fine. I think it's important to note here that this 2x6 is doing most of the work when it comes to carrying the load back and forth for everything that's coming across the middle. And this post really doesn't have a lot of structural significance at this point. So I'm going to cut it loose so that the front can be raised. At best, I'm probably going to scab a little 2x4 in there just for stability, but since the deck has got a propensity to sink and not raise, I don't have a problem putting a scab on that and just giving a little bit extra strength, but honestly, I don't think it's really significant. When a guy doesn't even take his welcome mat off the step, <laughs> when, he's, when he's building the deck, he's not pouring concrete. <laughs> there ain't no way. No footings, no concrete, no anything. Just dig a hole, shoved it in the dirt, and let the clay and the frost do all the rest. Now 
Now the idea here is to lift the deck and level it off. When you're building a deck structure, you've got to think about um, water removal as well. This front step has got to slope away from the house, so any water that gets past the deck will just go underneath the ground area here. That's perfectly fine. The rest of this deck, the boards are going to be going left to right. And so there's a space between every board for water to be removed. We don't need to maintain any kind of slope here. So we're going to try to raise this up to perfectly level. Here's our temporary support, which makes our gap, yeah, three inch. That's pretty intense. Important to note that in our region, check your local building code, but any structure like this that we build in our region under 24 inches has no building code. So there's no rules. So you can do your whole popsicle stick deck if you want to. But um, just so that I can sleep at night, I like to use some intelligence, some structural fasteners, a little bit of science. <sighs> but, uh, you know, legally, what this other homeowner had done, there's nothing wrong with it. So it was lousy, but it wasn't wrong because it's not illegal. Strange. I'm throwing in some limestone screenings here just so that I can level this off. And then I'm going to be throwing in a concrete slab. And the idea here is I want to, yeah, get that block right there. Perfect. Folks, if I'm an eighth of a degree off level, I'm going to be perfectly happy with it. That's structurally sound. Throw this on our new piece of wood that goes right from one side to the other. And this time I'm going to take a marker. I'm going to mark my post where I like it level. Okay. I'm also going to come at it from this side and have a look coming this way and we'll see if we're relatively in the same spot. That looks good. Yeah. So I'm going to take it up to here. Now this time I'm going to lift it to my line and then about an eighth of an inch above. Whew. That way, once I'm done putting all my aggregate down here, I'll be able to tamp it into place. Back off our screw and watch this. Right down to my line. Perfect. So with this, I'm just basically doing a splint. Knowing that if I put enough screws in this block, and that is basically six, I have 500 pounds of shear strength in this one corner. So I would have to fit um, six adults between that wall and this corner uh, and between here and here, jumping up and down with all their strength simultaneously before we are having a risk of having a high of structural failure. And I'm pretty sure that we're not going to end up with that kind of a scenario. All right. This is just really great for leveling things, eh? <laughs> By order of the peaky blinders. <laughs> so my favorite technique for installing a joist hanger and this is a two by six, it means that the hanger is a little shorter than the material I'm using, okay? Pinch it together so that it's sitting closed, and then you can force it open. Now, they have these tabs here. So once it's seated on the bottom of the wood, you use that tab, and it becomes like a little nail tooth that holds it in place. Once it's in place, you can come along. Now you don't have to have three hands anymore. Now these screws are inch and a half, which is perfect for this scenario. You're never going to screw through the wood and get your leg. 
<laughs> which is important to note because you can buy them longer. And if you do that by accident, it's uh, people have been known to throw a screw in their knee before. When you're doing a joy singer, every one of these little holes gets a screw. This is engineered to hold the bracket to the to your rim or your joist. This is engineered to hold this piece of material from separating from the bracket so it doesn't fall out of the seat. Okay? So, especially if you're building a deck and you're using technology like this and you're getting inspections, make sure you're using the proper fastener. This is a number 10. Okay? This is really fabulous for outdoors. And this is not a coated screw. It's ACQ compliant, but it's not a coated screw. This is an alloy. It's forged. It'll never rust. Period. Not like galvanized nails. Not like ACQ screws. That will never rust. And if you aren't using a forged alloy on your Simpson Strong Tie, you'll pay a fail inspection. And sooner or later, one of these days, it'll just fall apart. The copper in pressure treated in, in the pressure treated lumber is what causes the oxidation that kills your screw. So the coating only protects it for so long. That's why when you're dealing with structure, we deal with point load, we deal with brackets, we deal with forged screws. Those elements will never rust and will never fail. I mean, all the boards can lift off and rot off and that's fine. You're not gonna fall through your deck. There you go. So we have basically reconstructed our deck. We've got all our point loads taken care of. We have our new joist package in. We have joist hangers everywhere. We've put some new headlock screws right through the plate into the wall just to strengthen things up because it looked a little soft. Over here on the side, we've got a two by four that's carrying our load. This is really not right. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna transfer all of our load points on this front of the deck right from the framing to the porch by using cedar shimming technique. So the reality is our joist package that's carrying weight here is only three and a half feet long. So it's not a big concern that we're using a little smaller lumber there. That's what's there. And rebuilding that means tearing everything apart. And uh, nobody's in the mood for that. This deck's already been here for 20 years and nobody's had an accident. It's just kind of funny because here we've got this lovely two by six area that looks like they use scraps to do the job. <laughs> They've got two of them cut down here and a little scrap in the middle. It's just not gonna cut it, folks. When you're scabbing something like this in a wall, using a one foot piece is probably fine. But when you're doing it on a floor, you really want to laminate the majority of the board, if not the whole thing. And then here's the key. Every six inches, you want to go from high to low to high, like big W's all the way across the board. That's going to give you that strength of a triangle. Wood can't bend if it's attached in that manner. So that's how we do it. Up, down, and up. All right, nine, 10 screws, 80 pounds each, 800 pounds. That's not going anywhere anymore. So now it's not just flat. Oh, ho, ho. I'm loving it. You know, when you get down here close and personal like this, you almost see every last choice at the very last second come together and touch. That is absolutely sexy. I don't think we could have done that good a job with brand new lumber. So this is a little overkill, right? Reality is three of these screws will hold the whole deck up. These replace the strength of a 3 8 galvanized bolt, which means I don't have to drill, knock in a bolt, throw in a washer and a nut and then wrench it all together. I can just drive this in with my impact driver and, and I'm structurally sound forever. These things run about three to four dollars a screw, but if you ask me, I think it's worth it. The last step you really want to take care of and this is really simple, is you're going to have your outside ridge plate. And you want to create a nice level surface off the front, top and bottom. So there's two advantages to having this piece of wood down here. One, you have a skirt board that you can attach. That'll be flush. Two, when we put in our posts for our, our railing system, 
We don't have to go surface mount. We don't have to just rely on the first four or five inches of wood here to screw to. We can actually cut our post to go all the way down into here. So I can attach it down here in the middle and with the top rail. That creates three points of contact, which makes the entire deck so strong, no one will ever, 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 ever be able to fall through the railing like I did when we started the job. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk deck. There's our surface. We want a 42 inch deck rail. All right, and in our design, we would love to have our post just a little bit higher than our rail. So we have room for a decorative LED light on top in this corner and in this corner. So in order to accomplish that task, this here is a two by four on the flat. Okay, underneath that, is going to be, it's going to be made like a T, all right, like this. And this part is going to have the pre-drilled holes for the spindles coming down, okay? So we have this two by four, we have this two by four, and then a five quarter board on top of that even more, and that gets you your drink ledge surface. So we want to add all that together, five quarter, inch and a half, all right, and then that's our 42 mark. Boom, boom, boom. We're going to add two more, 44. So we'll go 44 inches above the surface of the deck here, which is inch and a quarter. Okay, because that's also inch and a quarter until we hit the frame. Got to remember that. And then we want to go inside the frame. That takes us to 45 and a quarter. Now, we bought eight foot posts. Okay. So an eight foot post, if we cut it in half, is 48. That only gives us about three and a half inches extension. We don't get down to the next rail in the bottom. Not the end of the world, but I'd really like to do that where the handrail ties in. So what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna do the math for the middle rail here, being a four by four, okay, to intersect with this. All right, so our 44 will come to here. So 44 minus inch and a quarter, half and Minus five and a quarter. That takes us to two and three quarters off of 44. It's 41 and a quarter. Okay, for that middle post. And then we'll throw in the five or well, four inches on top of that to get it into the deck frame. And then this one will be long enough to go all the way to the bottom. So if our major intersection points at the handrail and at the corner can be really buried, that's awesome. So we'll cut the first one at 41 and a quarter and that'll be for here. Shoot. And the balance we'll use here and we'll set it at the right height. And hopefully it'll get deep enough. Mm -hmm. So that'll be for in here somewhere. Okay, so I can throw a screw in there. That's where I want it to sit the height wise. All right, and I can find my spot. All right, so without even throwing a level in it. Just to get started. When you're building your frame, just before you start decking, make sure you get your structural posts in place. And by structural, I meant like railing structure. Um, the idea here is we want to know exactly what we're going to do for how we're cutting our lumber. Eight foot posts, this one's a little bit more than eight feet long. What I do is I just kind of grab a few of my materials from my order. I like to visualize the space. This is basically the height of that railing plus an inch because you want to keep a gap down there so that things stay nice and dry. Then there's another two by four and then a five quarter board. That leaves us with almost three inches of stub, which is perfect for the LED cap. Usually those lights only sit about an inch over the top and that'll just give everything a nice, clean, intentional look. And then the shorter post will just be brought over here somewhere in the middle. When we get into that kind of math, that's part of the railing design. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what we want to do is just make a mental note. This is going to be the height. Our middle post is going to be coming out of this deck right to this point. Okay. That's it. No higher.
I know we're only doing structure, but I'm gonna show you a little cheat here while you're building your deck that'll help make your railings look flawless because you wanna have a lot of consistency with the gaps. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our two spindle rails and we're gonna just set them in place. Now, the idea is here. It's coming from one side flush and from the other side flush. Now, right away, because of the pre-drilled from the factory, the gap from the post of the first spindle is exactly the same. And this is where the intersection is gonna happen. So I have a four foot section, right? So this is about my center. Now, visually, if that's my center, and I put my four by four post inside that corner of the frame, all right, I'm gonna on this post, I'm gonna have a quarter inch, and over here, my spindle will have to be cut in half. That's stupid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move down here to this location where I have from the corner here to this, about two inch, from corner here to this, about two inch. That now is my location. It is perfect, and I'm gonna measure from the post to my joist package, just over an inch. All right, now we can move everything out of my way. Now that I have my number, irony is, in order to make this perfectly square, I wanna be one inch from my joist to the beginning of my wood, which is just beside all my structural screws. Isn't that a lovely surprise? So this is where my post will go, and that'll be nice and tight. What I'm doing here is I'm not relying on the screws through the rim plate to hold the, the post. You'll find these things love to twist over time. Don't forget when cedar grows, cedar grows like this, okay? So when you cut it, it wants to untangle itself. That's why they always twist. So when you're putting in a post, even if it's overnight, you've got to have a top rail attached temporarily, screw it all in, and make sure that it's not going to all go twist on you. Because you'll come out in the morning and it'll be like, <laughs> you got candy cane deck. <laughs> and what this does, this gives me a lot of more support because now when there's pressure or force on the, on the railing up here going outwards, it's, it's levered here. And then the bottom inside the deck wants to go that way. So by putting this block here and I restrict the ability of the bottom of that post to swing into the deck, it extra, makes the, the top of the deck all that much stronger. So now when I'm pulling on this, I'm not just pulling on the top of this, I'm also creating a force on the bottom of this post going inwards. But with that blocking there, I don't have to rely on the thread on these screws to hold it in place. I also have the sheer strength of the screws going into the two by six here at three different points, help hold it all together. And the reason I've included this setting your railing posts and blocks in the framing video is because if you don't set your rails and your blocking before you put your decking on, the only option you have left is to notch them and hang them off the side. They split easy. Um, you could use those fancy little post cap things and screw it together and screw it down. And that's all fine and good in some scenarios. But this is actually gonna be a railing and there's actually gonna be people coming and going. And safety is a concern here because there's gonna be two stairs. So we wanna make sure that all of this is as rigid as humanly possible. And that is all part of structure. So we're just gonna get this finished up and then it'll be time to start laying the deck boards.